Amen. All right, I'd like to start with a question this morning, and that question is, is it better to know uh, or remember the past or to know the future? Is it better to remember the past or to know the future? Uh, when I was a little boy, my cousins and I, we liked to play this game with our uncles and with my dad, and we called this game Monster. And maybe you guys played a version of this game when you were kids, but basically what happens was the kids would go off and hide somewhere in the house, and the adults would then come looking through them in every room, every uh, crook and cranny, until eventually they found us, and we would jump out, and we would run down the hallways, kicking and screaming, flailing our arms, until eventually they would catch us, and they would wrestle us or just tickle us until they felt like letting us escape, and then we would go on our way running around the house again. And sometimes we like to reverse it and have the uncles and my dad go hide, and then we would go looking for them in the hallways. But I remember this specific time uh, when I was a kid where my family and my cousins, we had the opportunity to go to a beach house in Florida. A family friend of ours had been gracious enough to let us use it, and we had gone there with all of our cousins. And this place was a little sliver of paradise for us. I mean, it had a big couch, a big fridge, a big TV, a big kitchen. And, but the coolest part about it was that in the middle of all of it, with all these rooms, the bedrooms and the offices surrounding this middle area, in this middle area was an indoor swimming pool. And it had a waterfall, a heated pool. It was, like I said, a little sliver of paradise, especially for us troublemakers. And so this particular time, we went to our uncles and we, we bugged them enough until finally they relented and said, okay, okay, we'll play, we'll play this game Monster with you. And so the uncles and my dad went and hid somewhere in the house and us boys stayed in the kitchen. We set a timer on the microwave and it would eventually count down and go off signaling that the hunt had begun. So we went from room to room looking for our uncles with the one flashlight that we were allowed. And uh, bedroom after bedroom after office, we had found nothing. So finally, we came to the last bedroom, the master bedroom. And we walk in and try to see if anything's been tampered with. But sure enough, you know, the bed was made, the closet door was shut. Maybe they weren't in here after all. So we looked everywhere, behind the dresser, under the bed, in the closet, in the bathroom, nothing. Until on our way out, as we're walking out, we shine the flashlight across the wall and across the chair, and something catches our eyes. It was, in fact, another pair of eyes, and they blinked as we passed them with the light, and at that point, we knew it was already too late. And so we bolted. And you guys have played games like this. You don't have to be the fastest. You just can't be the slowest. And so we bolt out of the room through the swimming area. Yes, we were running out the pool, and we ran through the swimming area into the living room and slammed the screen door shut. We began to catch our bearings. You know, that we had started with seven of us, so well, we number off Josiah, Justin, Jess, Jonah, Jacob, Jared. Six. Where was the seventh? Where was our youngest cousin, Silas? And then we heard it, a giant thud. We look over at the screen door, and there's a giant Silas-shaped smear on the screen door. And there, under the door, is our cousin Silas, half, half laughing, half crying. And so before we have enough time to get him up and check if he's okay, we see our uncles bolting down the hallway after us. So we pick him up, and we run through the swimming area, into a bedroom, into the closet, out of the closet, into the office, out of the office, into the bedroom, back through the swimming area, back into the living room, slam the screen door shut. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then it happened again, a giant boom. And we look over, and there are now two Silas-shaped smears on the door. And there he is at the bottom, half laughing, half crying. You see, he had forgotten what had just happened, no doubt from the collision. But he had refused to remember the past in order to look to the future. So tell me, is it better to remember the past or to know the future? Is it better to remember the first time hitting the screen door or is it better to know that the second time is coming? Is it better to know the day you were, the day you were born or know the day that you will die? Is it better to remember your life as a child, the city you grew up in, your friends, your neighborhood, or to know the man or the woman that you would become with all your gifts and skill sets? Would you rather have pictures from your first birthday party or your last? Well, is it better to remember all the pain, all the struggle, all the intense parts of your life? 
or to know the storms and all the tribulations that are to come. Tell me, is it better to remember the past or to know the future? If you have your Bibles, would you turn them to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. 2 Samuel 7, 8. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the pew in front of you, or you can get out your phones, you can Google it, do whatever you got to do. But 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. As my dad said, we've been in this series titled Legends, where we look at some of the characters from the left side of our Bibles, and we try to discern how they lead others in their stories so that we can in turn lead others today. And my dad started off this series talking about King David. He started off by talking about leading from the heart, leading from the heart. And last week, Mike talked to you guys about leading by example and what it means to step out in faith and trust God. But this week, I'd like to talk to you about something different. I'd like to talk to you about leading to the kingdom. Lead to the kingdom. So in our text this morning, it's kind of important to know kind of what's going on in David's life. So at this point in David's life, he's around 37 years old, probably a little bit older. And he's been king now for about seven years officially. And so from, from this point in his life, he goes on and he, he attacks the city of Jerusalem and he claims it from a people group known as the Jebusites. And he makes it his new base of operations, his new home. And up until this point, he's been operating out of a city a little south of Jerusalem known as Hebron. But regardless, he's in Jerusalem, and from there he goes on and he attacks the Philistines. And he gets back the Ark of the Covenant that he lost, and he brings it back to Jerusalem, and he puts it in this tent called the Tabernacle, and he celebrates. But then on a day, you know, a calm day, sunny, not a cloud in the sky, he sits up in his palace, and he looks out at all that's before him. And he sees his kingdom before him. And he realizes something very important. He says, you know, while I sit up here in my palace, while I sit up here in this exquisite house made of cedar, God is down there living in that ruddy old tent that we made in the desert some hundreds of years ago. And he thinks to himself, you know, that's not fair. And so he says, I'm going to build a house for God. So what do you do when you have a problem or an idea? You go tell somebody about it. So he goes to Nathan, a prophet of the time, and he says, look, here's my dilemma. And Nathan looks at him and he basically says this. He says, look, you're the king. You do what you want. God has been behind you with every other endeavor that you've been on this for. I have no reason to believe he wouldn't be behind you with this one. So he says, go ahead, do what you plan to do. Little did he know, though, that that night Nathan would be corrected by God. That as he uh, lay his head down to go to sleep, God would come to him in a revelation and he would say this. He'd say, you go and tell David this. This is from me. He says, David, I've been around a lot longer than you have. Do you really think that I need a house? Do you really think that I need your house? I mean, I'm always working, always moving, always with my people. Do you really think I can be contained in a house, David? Do you know who I am? And this is God in the scene. Do you know who I am, David? So he says, all right, pull up a chair. Listen closely, because I'm going to remind you. And that's where our text picks up this morning. So read along with me, if you would, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 8. It says, now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. He says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and I appointed you as ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. And I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great. Like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel. And I will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning. And have done ever since I appointed leaders over my people Israel. Then he says, I will also give you rest from all of your enemies. And the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to secede you. Your own flesh and blood, I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father. 
and he will be my son. And when he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men and floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. And so God goes to Nathan and he gives him a timeline. And on this timeline are two basic points, two basic actions initiated by God for David. And the first one is this. God says, God establishes the king. God establishes the king. So I want you to picture where you grew up. I want you to picture where you once were. What are the sights? What are the smells? What do you see? For me, I see a driveway, long, paved by gravel, freshly cut grass on either side, and I would sit there for hours waiting for my brothers to come home from school. And I would sit there as the bus doors would squeal open and my two brothers would step off the bus and we would go on to play. I see the woods where I spent countless adventures exploring for hours until the sun would go down and the golden light would splinter through the trees. I see my baseball ceiling fan and the sports wallpaper that lined the walls near the ceiling in my room. as I would lay awake, supposed to be asleep during nap time. I see smiles. I see laughter. I see adventure. I see half-eaten dinner plates because I was too stubborn to eat the food in front of me because I was so picky. So tell me, what do you see? I'm not naive. I know that not every memory is a good one. I know for some of you, you may see a house filled with clutter, filled with baggage. Or maybe some of you, you can literally hear the voices of your parents screaming at each other, fighting over something so insignificant, so meaningless. And you can hear that in the room next door to you. Or maybe for some of you, when your past is brought up, or the place where you once lived, you've shoved that so far down, so far away from you that you never ever want to revisit that place again. So tell me, what do you feel when you're reminded of where you came from? Like, how do you feel when you're forced to remember your past? Where does your mind's eye roam? Where does your heart wander? For David, he sees the sheep. He sees the valleys, the caves that he slept in. He can smell the stench of a hard day's work. He, he remembers the shadows as they grew long and as the days grew longer. But he also remembers the shadows that were cast upon him from his brother's achievements. And God brings all of this to his attention with one phrase. He says, don't you forget your past. He says, don't forget the dirt that once covered your skin. Don't you forget the danger that you once encountered. Don't you dare forget your past, David. He says, David, do you remember those nights? Where you sat all alone, wallowing in your loneliness with not a star in the sky, and all the sheep that once surrounded you seemed meaningless. Do not forget those nights, David. And God reminds him of all of this by saying, I took you from that. I took you from out of the pasture, from tending the flocks, and I established you as ruler over my kingdom. David, do not forget your past. David, remember your pasture. But more importantly, David, don't you dare forget who it was who brought you out of it. God says, I did that. that that's my doing. You see, God cares about David's past. God establishes David despite his past. Do you think you are any different? There are no smooth stones in the kingdom. No, God's kingdom is built with the roughest of stones. And so God starts this revelation with a reminder. He says, I establish the king. But then the second action on this timeline is this. God expands the kingdom. God expands the kingdom. And the text then transitions into a list of promises for the future at the end of verse 9. And the first few are for the kingdom of Israel as a whole, as a nation, as a unit. And he promises them a place 
It's a place to live. That's land. That's the borders. But then he promises them peace. That's rest from their enemies. That's rest from their afflictions. It's peace in their land. But notice once again the formula. This is God doing all these things. Do not be fooled and think that David somehow established himself. No, this is God's doing. And so up on the screen is going to be a map. And on this map, there are two things I want you to notice. This map represents two distinct time periods. And as you can see, there's a border on the inside, and that's shaded by yellow. And that represents uh, the nation of Israel at the end of Saul's reign and the start of David's reign. But as you can see, there's several red arrows darting out of it and a much larger border. And that represents uh, the nation of Israel at the end of David's reign. All those red arrows represent his conquest to expand the kingdom. And as you can see, God used David in order that he might expand the borders of the kingdom. David almost tripled the size of the kingdom of Israel. However, the promises do not stop there. Not only does God promise to expand the borders of the kingdom with physical borders, he also says, I'm going to expand the kingdom through your line, David. He is continuously saying, David, your line will last forever. You, you will always have the right to rule. Your children will always have the right to rule. But no other king will. He's saying, look, David, uh, your line's going to last forever, and that's good. But more than that, he's saying, I'm going to use your line for eternity. He, he's looking at David and, he, and his children and saying, look, I'm promising you one thing, a relationship. And I'm no parent, so parents, correct me if I'm wrong. But all the time, deep down, no matter what, you want the best for your children. Uh, like, even when they run away, even when they would have nothing to do with you, even when they intentionally hurt you, do you not still want the best for your children? And God looks at David and he says, look, you don't have to worry about that. I'm going to take care of that. God promises him that his line will endure forever. And so God expands the kingdom in both space and time, both in borders and David's line. And he ends with these two things. He says, your house and your kingdom will endure forever. But then also your reign will endure forever. And we saw that God expanded the kingdom through its borders. We saw that on the map. It's easy to say that God stayed true to his word. He, he did what he said he would do. But as far as expanding the kingdom, the nation of Israel through David's line, like how did that happen? How, how can we possibly say that God kept his word? Because, I mean, David lived and David died. And then his son Solomon became king and he lived and he died. And then another king and another king and another king until eventually the kingdom was overran. Eventually the throne was laid bare. How can we possibly say that God stayed true to his word? How can we possibly say that God fulfilled his promise that he would expand the kingdom through David's line? For the throne was empty. And it stayed that way for hundreds of years. Until one night, as the stars radiated in the sky and a cool breeze rushed over the land, in the dead of night where silence echoed throughout the streets, where once super busy town lay asleep, crammed into all available space. A little ways off in a stable uh, covered in dirt and, and in grime, the animals slept nearby. And the flies buzzed relentlessly and the stench of the animals could be smelled in the family's noses who dwelled there that night. Until in one moment, a cry would break the silence as a king would be born that night. A king born in the dirt, born in the grime, born in the slop of Bethlehem. A king whose name traced back to David, a king who, who had the right to rule. And God would establish this king out of the dirt and out of the grime into the backwoods of Nazareth. And this boy, God would watch him as he went from a boy into a man. And this man would go on and he would help people. And he would heal people. And he would look at the seemingly dirty people of this world who had nowhere to belong. And he would love them. But then the time would come for this king's coronation day. And he would be led through the streets, crowds of people yelling, screaming, chanting above all the noise. But it was not for the life that he would live. It was for the death that he would soon die. 
And he would be led up a hill, ascend Golgotha, but it was not with a head held high. And his throne was neither made of silver or gold, but of wood. But then the crown would be brought out, right? And it would sparkle in the light as the blood that dripped from the thorns that penetrated his scalp covered it. And the crowds would chant and they they would sing, but they would not chant the phrase, long live the king. It's a much different phrase. And it sounded like, crucify him. Crucify him. You see, God would establish this king on a cross. And Jesus would die for the sins of humanity. He would take the punishment that we all deserved upon himself. But we all know he he didn't stay dead. For three days later, he would rise from the dead in order that he might expand the kingdom to all people. And all people would be welcome. The rich, the poor, the dirty, those who could hear their parents arguing in the room next door, the little boys who refused to finish their dinner plates. And even those who sat in the dark, wallowing in their filth, with no one to turn to, nowhere to go, They just wanted a glimpse of hope. So God established Jesus out of death and into life so that we might experience life forever, for all eternity. And he opened the door to you. He opened the door to me. And he looked at our past. He looked at my past. He promised a future. Do you really believe that? Like, honestly, deep down, do you honestly believe that? Like, when you take a look at the story of David, when you look at that little shepherd boy, and you see how God established him out of that into a king, but it wasn't without reason. It was in order that David might go and he would expand the borders of the kingdom of Israel, or take Jesus, for example, who died such a gruesome death at the hands of mankind. He was beaten, bloodied, bruised, killed. But it wasn't without reason. God established Jesus out of death and into life so that he might expand the kingdom. God establishes so that God can expand. Do you think you are any different? Like when you look at the past, when you look at your past, when you look at the present, When you stay awake at night, too afraid to fall asleep because you know you have to get up the next day. Or when you're hurt or alone or suffering. Or when you're just addicted to that one thing that literally just drains the life out of you. Do you honestly believe that God will pull you out of it? Do you honestly believe that God will establish you? As my dad said, in your bulletin is a card. That card looks like this, and if you would, pull it out. I want you to flip to the side with just one dot on it. Looks like this. And that dot represents you. That dot is everything that has ever happened to you up until this point. Every pain, every success, every event, it's everything. Everything that's ever happened to you until this point. And this dot doesn't have much width to it. It doesn't have much height to it, but, but it's full of depth. And this dot is like a story. And if we were to somehow open this dot up, we would see all the chapters of your life, your emotions, your friends, everything. So I want you to think about your story. I want you to think about the ups. I want you to think about the downs. But specifically, I want you to focus on two parts of your story, your highest highs and your lowest lows. Like when were you at your best? But also when when were you at your worst? And I recognize for some of you, you're there right now. And I get that. But I want you to look at these events. I want you to look at your story through a different lens, through a different view. Because most of the time, this is pretty hard for us, if we're being honest with ourselves. Like most of the time when we think of our lives, we think of them as solely ours. You know, I I pull myself up. I excel at work. I did this or I did that. I established myself. So I want you to take that mindset and I want you to hold it really close. Then I want you to throw it out the window because that's useless right now. And I want you to think of your story in this way. What if God, 
and I know, bear with me. What if God pulled you out of some of the more difficult, different situations in your life in order that he might establish you into his kingdom? Like, what if God brought you here today because he wants you to be a part of something bigger than yourself? Like, how has God established you to his kingdom? For some of you, you may have been sick. And I mean, like, like really sick. But you got better. And so you started going to church. Or maybe for some of you, you were just lonely. Like, like so lonely. Like, you had no one to go to, nowhere to belong, and you stumbled in here and that's where you are now. Or maybe for some of you, you're just tired, so tired of living a life, chasing after things that simply just do not satisfy you. Or maybe for some of you, you have that sin or that habit that you've left in the dark. And you've tried time and time again to get rid of it. You've just tried so hard on your own to shake it, but you can't. And you just want so desperately to tell somebody about it. But you can't find the strength. You just want a way out. Maybe for some of you, you've just been hurt. You've been beaten so far down by this world, plunged into the ground below you. And you're just looking for a way to stand, but you just can't. This world is unrelenting. You just want rest. You just want relief. So I don't know what that looks like for you, but I want you to hear me, whatever this looks like for you. I want you to know God loves you. And I want you to know that he's trying to invite you into a relationship with him. He wants you desperately to be established in Christ. And so whatever that looks like for you, at the top of this paper, I want you to write two words. And it's these words, he has, he has. And then I want you to fill in the blank about what God has done in order you to establish you into his kingdom. And I want you to write that down. And I recognize that some of you, you don't have some huge transformational story. Maybe some of you are like me and you've just known God your entire life. So I don't say that pridefully. I don't say that braggadociously. But the truth is, you've just grown up knowing who God is. And I know for some of you, you don't think that's a testimony, but the fact that you're still here today is a testimony in and of itself. And so to those of you who have been through countless storms, who have gone through several trials and tribulations and come out on the other side, I want you to know God won't waste your pain. But to those of you who have loved God your entire lives, I want you to know God won't waste your faithfulness. And so write it down, he has, and then fill in the blank about what God has done in your life to establish you into his kingdom. And then when you're done, I want you to flip it over. And if you notice on this side, this dot doesn't have any movement to it, it's not going anywhere. But on this side, we have a ripple. Now, as a boy, I love to throw things into water. And you guys know the bigger the thing you throw, the bigger the splash, the bigger the ripple. And a ripple travels from its source outwards to the borders of the lake, borders of the body of water. And in the same way, God has established you in order that you might travel from the source, God, out into the borders of your world, the borders of the body of Christ. And so he has caused this epicenter of transformation so that you might expand his kingdom. God establishes so that God can expand. So when you think about how God has established you, when you think about what he's done in your life, do you ever just ask, you know, why? Well, like, why are you here on a Sunday morning? Or like, why did God pull David out of the pasture? Why did you make it through the things that you have? The answer's never changed. It's so that God can use you to expand his kingdom. So the question then becomes, how are you going to use the ways that God has worked in your life the ways that God has established you individually in order that you might expand the kingdom. God wants to use your story of transformation and let it send ripples across the city you live in, across the workplace where you work, across the family you live with. So what does that look like for some of you? It looks like finding somebody who struggles with the same thing you do and helping them overcome it. 
It looks like bearing that person's burdens alongside of them. Or maybe for some of you, it looks like finding somebody younger than you are, somebody less experienced than you are, and walking beside them, showing them what it means to be a man or a woman of God and mentoring them. Or maybe for some of you, it's just simply this, to inspire, to use the story that God has given you in order that it might further the kingdom. Or perhaps for some of you, if we're being honest, we're still stuck on this page. And for some of you, it's just recognizing simply that God has worked in your life, that you didn't pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, that God has worked and put you in certain places so that you might become part of his kingdom. I don't know what that looks like for you, but at the top of this side with the ripple, I want you to write these two words, I will, I will. And I want you to fill in the blank about what you're going to do because God has established you into his kingdom. So on this side, it says he has, and because he has, I will. And so we want this card, we want this card to be a snapshot of your story. We understand that you can't fit every detail, every single part of your life story onto this little card. We're not asking that of you. But at the bottom, we've put an email address. And we do want to know about your stories. We do want to know what God has done, what God is doing in your lives. So we put an email address at the bottom of this, mystory@vvcc.org. And what we'd ask you to do is we'd ask you to take this home and let it jumpstart you to thinking about this, your story and how God has worked in your life. And we want you to use your story, how God has established you in order to expand. And one of the ways you can do that is maybe by simply just writing out your entire story, writing out all the different ways that God has worked in your life and sending it to that email address so that we can know about that and so that we can begin to maybe use your story to help expand the kingdom. Or maybe for some of you like Gary, in a second you'll see, um, he made a video and he took, he took this card and he said, man, God has done this in my life. I recognize that God has done this in my life. But because he has done that, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do about it. And so we want some of you to maybe either write out your story, bring it to the office, send it to this email, or maybe make a video, or maybe you can find another creative way to use how God has worked in your life to expand his kingdom. This is a great way to use how God has established you to expand. So let's use this to lead others as we lead toward the kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. God, I'm so grateful for all the people in this room and just their devotion to you and their willingness to come here and just learn uh, more about you, God. God, I'm so grateful for all the ways that you've worked in my life and the lives of the people here today. God, I pray that they would recognize that and recognize that you have established them. Uh, but God, also that you're calling them to expand the kingdom. So God, I ask that they would go throughout the rest of the week and they would find ways to expand the kingdom, whether they write their story out, they make a video, or simply they just tell somebody about you, God. God, I pray that we would be faithful. We love you so much. In your name we pray, amen.